I never fucked anybody over in my life. Didn't have a comment. You got that? All I have in this world is my balls and my word. And I don't break them for no one. Do you understand? I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. I work for Kaiser Soze. C'est colère, les enfants, je suis colère! What's up, party people? Welcome to Admit One, your movie ticket. I am your host, Jim. Today, we're gonna be doing Jaws. So my first interaction with Jaws wasn't actually Jaws. It was Jaws 4 or Jaws the Revenge. I want to say, what grade was I in? Maybe 6th grade? Yeah, because I think it was around the time Scream came out. So I was really into horror at the time and I had a horror themed birthday party. So my mom took me to our blockbuster, which for you youngins out there is a store where you used to go to that had um hundreds of videos that you could pay someone to take home for a few days and then bring it back it was what was called renting so i my mom took me to blockbuster and i rented a couple of horror movies jaws the revenge was one of them so that was my first interaction with actually watching a jaws movie i knew what jaws was um and I knew the theme song, obviously, but I hadn't actually seen Jaws, the actual movie, um, until it was released on like a, what, probably like a 30th anniversary VHS or something. came with two tapes. The second one had a bunch of special features on it, and I talked my mom into buying it at Costco. It might have still been Price Club at the time, Um, although I don't know why I did that, to be honest with you. It was probably right at the beginning of me falling in love with movies, so maybe that's why I wanted her to go get it. But she did, so credit her to that, although I only watched it one time on VHS. Um, It was cool to me at the time to see all those special features, because I was really into wanting to know how um, movies were made. Today, I don't want to watch special features. Movie-centric documentaries are great. I love those, like... um, Never Sleep Again for the Nightmare on Elm Street franchises. Or um, there's some on the Batman DVDs that came out. They're spread out over the four. Those are really good. There's one on the Island of Dr. Moreau as well. Um, I I really enjoy those. But as far as behind-the-scenes features where they show you, like, um, how uh, the scene was constructed and how they went about making the computer uh, models and things like that, that totally ruins it for me now. And I, it's like seeing where your food is made. If, you, if you've ever seen that movie slash documentary, uh, Fast Food Nation, I think it is, that'll make you not want to eat fast food or anything like that. So it's kind of like the same with special features for me. So, But back then, it was really cool to see that stuff. So it gave me a kind of a lot of insight into movie making and, and my respect for it. Um, I had a sweet Jaws poster that I had uh, in the bathroom when I first moved here to Arizona, but my ex took it, so if you're listening to this, I'd like it back. Movies were made differently back then. Today, I think if you made this movie, you'd probably be lucky if it went uh, straight to video. Um, just look at any of these monster movies made today, really. I'm over, I'm oversimplifying this movie, but... You know, just look at movies like The Shallows or anything like that. Like, they're not respected like they were back then. Maybe it's because we overdo it? I don't know. It, it's not my place to say, but... But because this material was treated with respect back then, it propels this movie into the classic territory. And it really is a, like a criminal investigation, with elements of horror, of course, but it's a murder investigation. You could replace a shark with a serial killer, and it would be the same movie. I think that's what separates it, because it was written from a different perspective. Maybe not intentionally. I haven't read the book, but this movie seems like it was written 
with that in mind. Kind of like how they say, like, ah, oh, Captain America the Winter Soldier is a, a spy movie. Well, not really, but you know what I mean. That kind of thinking. It's also a good allegory for crime in general and how people react to it. You can kind of see, and I'll talk about it in a minute, but, like, no one really cares. You know what I mean? Um, there's one good cop, and he's trying to do the right thing, but it's interfering with how other people are acting, so they they don't agree with what his actions are. So maybe that's a debate later on, but it utilizes a strategy that is sorely lacking today, uh, which is less is more, just like in Predator. You don't see the whole Predator until the last 20 minutes or so, tops. I want to look at the monster, but at the same time, my brain can recognize that it's more important not to. What your brain doesn't see makes it scarier and worse for you. The imagination is, is far more disturbed, if you will, than what you can actually see on screen. You don't see much of the shark at all, obviously. That's on purpose. Um, if you know anything about this movie, um, you know that they did it for reasons, mostly because the shark didn't work that the didn't work the way they wanted it to, but those reasons helped it become as scary as it is. So I, I wonder if computers have made us lazy. Granted, it, it propelled movie making into the stratosphere, but at the same time, are we losing the magic of things, uh, you know, of, of certain situations like this movie here? If you took this screenplay today and made it today with without it being a remake, like it's the original thing, with today's technology, would it be as scary? I, do, I, I don't think so. If you have a differing opinion, reach out to me. Let's talk about it. I, I firmly don't think so. They get around that crappy shark by not showing it. And it's better for it. It's kind of like, uh, what do they call it? Um, a happy accident, if you will. So the monster is always obscure, even when it, it, you know, when it attacks and things like that. My favorite shot is when it, it grabs that boy when everyone's on the beach and it kind of rolls around him. That is my favorite shot of the movie. So this is where I was talking about earlier people's weird reaction to crime and, and things that don't affect them. Two people die. Two. They got the girl at the beginning and I believe the boy right after. I believe he was the second one. And they don't care. They want to enjoy their beach holiday because they're a tourist city. They don't care that two people have died. The mayor is even a double ass because he knows what's right and still does the wrong thing. He does it again in Jaws 2, but we'll get to that. Jaws 2 really should have been about the lawsuits uh, by the people against the town for threatening their safety. You don't even need a shark. You know, the, the only shark is the lawyer wearing a shark skin suit, which are terrible, by the way. He used to own one of those. That was a bad choice. So speaking of the mayor, like, when they first uh, talk to the mayor about what's going on, I believe it's after, um, which I would never do, by the way. It's after uh, they go, they find that boat at nighttime, right? And Dreyfus dives into the water to investigate. The dark-ass water, by the way, I would never do that. You're lucky if you get me in a pool at nighttime. Well, if there's a... Uh, dangerous shark swimming around, you bet there's no way in hell that I'm jumping in that water. But afterwards, they come to the mayor, and he's like, they're trying to explain to him what's going on, what kind of shark is out there. I, is that like a Spielberg trademark, where there's multiple conversations going on at one time? Um, the only other example I have of it is in Jurassic Park, when they're standing by the Velociraptor cage. Um, there's two different conversations going on there. If you have other examples of that, let me know. But what I didn't realize was half the movie takes place on 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 um, his boat, the Orca. I didn't realize that. Uh, that's a long time. And you'd think, like, yeah, there's the ending that's famous, right, when he blows up the shark. But a lot of that stuff comes from the first half of the movie, you know, pe what people recognize from that movie. So that's kind of interesting to me. And once they get on that boat, that shark turns into a vindictive asshole. Almost, it borderlines, uh, sequel territory there of what that shark is acting like. There's a nice actual footage though, like when they drop that, um, shark cage into the water. Like that's where I learned that was from those special features of that VHS I was talking about earlier. When the shark gets stuck up top, that's a real shark. And it's not 
like the transition to it isn't jarring. Like sometimes in movies, like they have an animatronic and, and the next episode we do King Kong. So, or I do King Kong. So, um, when they go from the man in the suit to the robotic arm, like you can tell the difference. Like in this one, it's not, you can tell the difference, but it's not jarring in any means. Like you're not like, Oh my God. Like it, you're like, is that real? Is that a real shark? Like I didn't, if you cat, if you, if you don't know that and you're watching that movie, I would, I would bet that you didn't, you couldn't ca catch that that's a real shark. And I do believe that that was unintentional footage. Um, it just happened to get stuck there. They didn't do it on purpose. And so nice of Dreyfus to show up after they kill the shark. You know, after, um, Roy Scheider kills the shark. You know, just swim to the bottom of the ocean, let other people worry about that problem. And recently I was reading on Twitter that, uh, some people think this movie is overrated. Um, and while the ending does drag a little bit, and it's not everyone's cup of tea, that's fine, whatever, you can't deny the film's importance. You really can't. It redefined what a summer movie is, or defined, rather. Before, it, Spielberg is like the inventor of the summer movie blockbuster. This, E.T., things like that, like, he invented the, the summer tentpole movie. There, there's no denying it. And he's arguably one of our greatest filmmakers ever. So, and this was his second movie. I'm sorry if I'm wrong. I know Duel was his first, so if this is his second. Like, this movie's so good for being such a second movie out of the gate. So you've got the summer blockbuster, Steven Spielberg, and of course, the score, which, you know, I talked about last time about um the argument that Marvel doesn't have uh memorable scores. This is one of those memorable scores, obviously. Spielberg and John Williams, I would say, have the most recognizable scores out there uh, in terms of their collaboration. Obviously, Spielberg doesn't make the, mu the music, but, you know, John Williams has got Jaws, uh, Indiana Jones, Star Wars, uh, things like that. So that is obviously uh, one of the important factors of this movie. So you can't argue that. It, you may not like the movie, that's fine, it's not everyone's going to, and you don't have to. But you can't deny the importance of this movie. And the most important thing of this is the inspiration for Brian Singer's production company, Bad Hat Harry. That is by far the most important thing in this movie. I will fight you on that. And you'd be stupid to not make a sequel to a successful movie. So what did they do? They made a sequel. Jaws 2. The second one. It's neat that they find the orca, the wreckage of the orca at the beginning. It's always weird when they show the underwater shots in these movies, though, because it's clearly um, filmed under like 12 feet of water because it's so bright down there, even though you know that they were in the middle of the ocean. Even when Dreyfus swims to the bottom at the end of the first one to escape doing any real uh, legwork, you can tell that they filmed it on probably that soundstage there at Universal. I'm not knocking it. I'm just I'm making little jokes. And it feels like everyone signed on to this because they thought Spielberg was, and then they show up for filming the first day, and I'm like, oh, shit, where's where's he at? Oh, sorry, guys. Can't do it. And I do believe this one was... They had trouble with their directors, I believe. I believe they fired one halfway through, and his script was a lot different. That may have been number four, but I think it's this one. And I don't remember his name, so I apologize. Yeah, they brought him on, and they didn't like where it was going, so they fired him. And then... And it had some relationship to the outlaw Josie Wales, too. Like, they couldn't... They had to find a specific director for it. It was weird. So, you know, uh, if you know that story, let me know. Um, I think it's on Wikipedia, but I don't feel like looking it up right now. Jaws 2 should al almost be called Jaws the Revenge. Um, it's the same parallel storyline, kind of. They They broach it in this one a little bit, but they kind of fully flesh it out in Jaws the Revenge. We'll talk about that in a second, but... This one fails to recapture the magic of its predecessor. It It's darker, you know what I mean? Like, And I talked about that in Sherlock Holmes where everything's got to be bigger and darker in a sequel. But sometimes that's what made the original so special. So I'm all for making your own thing, but you got to bring people back to why uh, they fell in love with the first one in the first place. 
What it does do right, and this is probably unintentional, I guess, is Roy Scheider's character has become paranoid. Not paranoid enough, as we'll see in future installments, but he, like, takes it to the next level. Everyone around him even got stupider this time. Even the mayor, who fucked it up the first time, is up to his usual shenanigans again when there's another shark. Like, you know what happened last time. Hello? And Roy Shire's character even literally suggests that the shark is doing this on porpoise. Which was later, like, they like that's what I say later in Jaws 4. That is that is the storyline. It is attacking them on purpose. There's a... They, he cleverly explains it in this one about how they could send electrical impulses to each other or whatever, but in the fourth one, it's just it's just off its rocker. Um, it get, this one gets ridiculous too, when the shark attacks the skier and uh, <laughs> that person shoots the flare into the boat and it blows up. But what I did like about that scene was it gave the shark a sweet little scar, and it kind of it plays along with the horror trope. Like, is it the same killer or is it a copycat? I kind of liked that. Like. These people are so, they were so scared from the first one. They didn't learn a whole lot, obviously, but they're so scared from the first one that they're wondering if it's the same shark come back from the dead. I'm surprised they didn't go like a robo shark route. You know what I mean? The original shark seemed like a predatory beast until the end when it became a vindictive asshole. But this one was just an ass from the get go. Like, it wasn't an accident. Like, it, it really did seem like it was, uh, searching people out. Not necessarily, Roy Shire's family, but it seemed like it was searching people out on purpose. And is it normal to fill your bullets with cyanide? Is that a thing? Especially when you miss every single shot and it doesn't come into play ever again? Like, he doesn't kill the shark with those cyanide bullets. He just fires them into the water. It's a shark, not a werewolf. There's only so much you can do with a shark attack movie, but I think this is how I would have played the first one in terms of the shark's behavior, I guess. Not seeking people out but i think i would have done more like maybe a couple more attacks before they actually um resort to going out there and hunting it i think that's what i would have done it does feel like a logical sequel though even though it is fucking ridiculous people are you know like i said roy scheider is uh paranoid he doesn't want people going in the water he's got that shark lookout tower like people are are reeling from the the events of the first one it's just poorly executed again i'm surprised they didn't go with a robo shark you know what i mean they may have done a robo shark uh version in that spoof trailer for back to the future or whatever when they did all those sequels for jaws what i did like uh was that they electrocuted the shark instead of blowing it up again that's uh, a good way to not seem stale i bet that shark smelled good though electrocuting flesh out there in the water mm. a darker version of that though was roy wanting the shark to kill him too like he hangs on to that electric thing and he's just done with the shit of the shark and he's like you know what i'm going down too he eventually does not in the way that you might expect i'm surprised they didn't for this wackiness that is jaws 4 and what better way to capitalize on the 3d trend than jaws 3d i will say though uh that that title reveal when it bites in it's pretty jawsome and why has there not been a 3D re-release of this? There are plenty of 3D televisions out there. I think there should be a 3D re-release of this. I hate 3D. I don't own any 3D uh, movies or anything or a 3D TV. I personally would rather have an IMAX TV. You know, I'm sure there's a market for it. This is what I want in uh, today's 3D movies. But to a better extent, those those pandering shots, you know, where things flying out at the screen or floating right in front of you or whatever. I think they did it a little bit in, in, in the new Piranha, a little dirtier, but I want those 3D pandering shots. When you watch it 2D, it's, it's terrible. <laughs> they linger too long on it. It's poorly edited in there and the 2D version, like it is just, it's not good when you watch it like that, but it's clear that that's what they were doing. And it's, it like, it takes what they did in Friday the 13th 3D and just like pumps it full of steroids. But it is a good thing that they moved away from Amity Island, uh, because three times in one spot would just be overkill. But I didn't know until this time that Dennis Quaid is the same damn Mike from the first two. I'd be like, get me away from water. I think working at SeaWorld would be, uh, the last job I would want. But his brother, 
is the one who's afraid of water, sort of. He eventually goes in, you know, for a lady, but he had the smart idea, like, stay the F away from water. This movie just gets ridiculous anyway with its Harry Potter crocodile Dundee looking villain who also ends up being a hero, which is weird, and not for any good reason, just because they want video of the shark, I guess. I don't know. In my opinion, like I said, Jaws didn't have enough attacks, the first one. Jaws 2 maybe had too many, but Jaws 3 is just flat out boring. There's one attack in the first 35 minutes. I think for a quote-unquote shark attack movie, that's how you would start it out, is with a shark attack, not 35 minutes into it. I do appreciate, however, the different story. It's just not exciting at all. Like, there's so much potential here. That water uh, in that lagoon is dark and scary and it's confined, but it falls flat, big time. falls right on its face. And when that Australian gets eaten by the shark, that is a genuinely terrifying shot because it's inside the mouth with that diver. Whew. Talk about deep-seated fears right there. That's why I don't go in the ocean right there. And the shark in this one is 35 feet long. To put that in perspective, the original one was 25, and the largest great whites in the real world are about 20 feet. So this one is ginormous, and there's nothing wrong with having a huge shark, don't get me wrong. It's just underutilized in the story and wholly unnecessary uh, to the story they're telling. And the dolphins save the day. The people don't even save the day. It's the dolphins. I just think there was they, they could have done so much with that, like started off from the beginning, like, the shark sneaks in there, or both sharks rather, and maybe they do try to keep it alive, but that big one's in there and it keeps attacking people in there and then they, there's people down in the little underwater thing just like it is, you know, currently, and they still get trapped down there, but make it a little more perilous, which by the way, if that thing was real, I'd be there in a heartbeat. I'd, I'd walk through that thing all day, even though I hate the water. Like I would, that just seems so cool to me, but it's, you know, they get trapped in there and you don't care. <laughs> yeah, they're not under any danger because the water stops filling in there. Like, I don't know. It, it, I don't know if you notice this too. It does, the shark does roar a few times. They blend it in with some sound effects, but it does roar. So maybe it is related to, uh, the next one in the series, Jaws the Revenge. People love claiming weird Christmas movies as Christmas movies. Like, they're like, oh, Die Hard's my favorite Christmas movie. I think that's weird. Christmas Vacation is my favorite Christmas movie because it's a movie about Christmas. If a movie takes place during Christmas, doesn't automatically make it a Christmas movie. I'm sorry, guys. And if you were to think that, then Jaws 4 is your next uh, Christmas movie. You can add that to the list because guess what? It takes place during Christmas. And like I said... This was my first experience with the Jaws movie. Uh, I knew what they were, and I caught the tail end of it on TV and stuff like that, but it wasn't until I rented from Blockbuster to actually see um, this one and the straight-up roar. Like, the shark roars in this. And when I was little, I had no idea sharks couldn't roar. When you're little, that makes them scared. It's roaring at you. But that's it. It, it ain't real. Sorry. I'm sorry if you still believe that. I didn't mean to burst your bubble. So like I said... This one takes an idea from number two and fully fleshes it out in that the shark is literally seeking these people out. That's not a bad idea in and of itself. You know, these people have been affected by the shark for so long that when the fourth one comes around, they're like, are you fucking kidding me again with this? But the movie takes it in a literal term in that the shark actually hunts them to the Bahamas, which... Uh, the movie says that sharks don't, or the great whites don't go, so it, it implies that this shark has received psychic impulses from the first two slash three, and it is now hunting these people down. This shark hunted people down. The other two sequels are ridiculous in how bad they are. This one was ridiculous in its premise and execution. Uh, the shoot was mega rushed. They completed filming in May and had to have the movie out by July of that year. And what's interesting about the Jaws movies is they all have big name stars attached to them. The first two had 
Roy Scheider and Richard Dreyfuss in the first one. The third one had Dennis Quaid in it. This one has Michael Caine and Mario Van Peebles, who was big around this time, I think. Um, was it because it was the start of their career, maybe? Um, like Johnny Depp in Nightmare on Elm Street type? I don't know. I'm not sure how long Dennis Quaid or Michael Caine had been around before they were in a Jaws movie. Neither of the other two sequels, like this one, number four or number three, that none of them go out of the way to show that it's the same family. A few throwaway moments, and uh, it, I've seen... I've seen these several times uh, over the years, and it wasn't until I was researching this podcast that I actually kind of realized that they were all um, the same family. I knew about this one because, again, this was the first movie I'd seen of Jaws, and through the flashbacks and stuff like that, I knew it was related to the first one. I didn't know the third one was uh, until this time, and it's weird. Like, this one largely ignores the events of Jaws 3, which doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, it personally bothers me when movies try to ignore their predecessors when they aren't even good themselves. Like, Predators did that. They they made this big stink, like, oh, it, it totally ignores Predator 2, which is a good movie, but it doesn't even reference Predator 1 except for the original Predator. The, the design, you know, which they lifted directly from that which is weird but i don't get why they have to ignore movies like that it, it made no sense in the movie itself it doesn't explicitly ignore three but it's never mentioned and universal even released a press release saying uh it was the third in the jaws trilogy uh, maybe they were doing that because jaws 3d was like uh an event i guess i don't know it, it's just odd to me it's such a weird decision to ignore jaws 3 is it because they thought they had an Oscar-winning uh, movie on their hands? I personally find this one more watchable than Jaws 3, but that doesn't mean it's any better, I guess, in terms of what a quote-unquote good movie is. Um, for a shark that's supposedly hunting these people down, you'd think uh, you'd think the filmmakers would put in a few more scenes actually displaying this. Seriously, an hour into it, and the only evidence in it, let alone attacks, which it, it attacks those people on the beach, weirdly, are uh, are the first attack, so back home, and the one in the Bahamas. And that may or may not even be the same shark. We don't know for sure at this particular point. I don't even think they explain it at all, if it is the same shark, the one that, that killed the brother and then came and followed him down to the Bahamas. And again, this one is light on the attacks. It's got the first one. Uh, the one where it attacks the people on the beach, and then it chases Michael into the boat, and then the final scene. Like, that's it. And that's it's weird now that she's adamant about her son being out of the water. Uh, your husband killed two sharks, first of all. Your son killed a third, sort of, maybe, if it is part of the series. Pfft, apparently not. Uh, but it takes your other son dying for you to have these feelings to stay out of the water. She finally, the mom finally... The mom finally speaks some sense that should have been spoken a long time ago, although she doesn't follow it, that they need to stay out of the water. Because she's like, you guys need to stay out of the water. And then when they go to the Bahamas, she's like, look at that water, I'm going in it. And the original had these clever ways of depicting the violence that the shark does to people. Like like I said, they were trying to uh, hide the crappy mechanical shark, um, so they they put it in the background, or they wouldn't show it at all as it's dragging the girl across the water. This one decides to depict the violence by slam cutting into your face and showing these uber close-ups of sharks and victims and weird things going on. I, I, I couldn't tell you what's going on. It, it honestly feels like someone sat on the keyboard when they were doing these uh, attacks. The editing keyboard, rather. The most ridiculous part of this movie, though, is when the shark chases Michael into the ship. Like, how does it fit in there? It's supposed to be a huge shark. Look, this movie's bad. If you can avoid it, like, you can watch the first Jaws and be and be good. You don't need to watch the other three. But Mario Van Peebles and Michael Caine are strangely enjoyable in this movie. Uh, but Michael Caine is awfully reckless in his plane that he flies. Letting a child steer your car as you're driving down the street at four miles an hour is one thing. Letting a child sit on your lap and steer a plane is something completely different. 
Like, I've never flown a plane, but I can imagine it's pretty hard. And when he's talking to the mom in the plane, I half expected him to say, the size of a tangerine. And if you know what I'm talking about, please give me a digital high five, because that's awesome. What's nice about this series, though, is that as the quality goes down, so does the runtime. I've seen this movie several times. Um, like I said, it's the first one I'd ever seen. And I was watching it the other night on Netflix, by the way. And I had, I had read up on it previously, and I had learned that there's two different endings to it. There's one that I'm used to and then a completely different one. So I'm watching this expecting to see what I had normally seen um, every time I'd watched this before. But apparently the version on the net, on Netflix right now is the original theatrical ending. So if I were to suggest this movie to you, it would be to see that original ending uh, only. Otherwise you have to buy the DVD. You can even search it on YouTube. There's a nice little uh, a video that kind of breaks down the the differences so you can kind of see what they had to do after um, their test screenings or whatever it feels very rushed in either case so it, it doesn't matter but in the original one uh, the shark comes up and eats um, Mario Van Peebles off the end of the boat right there and then takes him underwater and he dies then the boat it, it's like when I say rushed the mom is driving the boat and the shark jumps out of the water in, in the scene, it seems like the shark is jumping out of the water like maybe 50 feet ahead of her. But it then slam cuts to the the front of the boat, which is now broken off because the shark bit Mario Van Peebles, slamming into the side of that shark. And then the weight of the shark like rips the front of the boat off. And then there's this really cool scene, though, where it's underwater and then the, the impaled shark is coming down with blood streaming down, down the water in front of you. Whereas in the one that I'm used to, like the shark still grabs Mario Van Peebles off the end and the boat still hits the shark. But for some reason when the shark or when the boat hits the shark, like its fucking head explodes and then Mario Van Peebles lives. That's the one I'm used to. And I guess that's the one on, on the DVD version as well. Um, so I just thought that was interesting. It, like I said, if you're going to watch this movie, watch it for that ending alone, just so you can kind of see the difference there. Um, either way, it's a rushed ending. Like, it just, boom, that's it. Maybe 30 seconds. There's no build-up, no climax, like the shark chasing Roy with the, the tank in his mouth in the first one. There's nothing like that. It's just, boom, and it's done. So that's it for Jaws today. Until what? next time, that's a wrap. Mr. Brown, that's a little too close to Mr. Shit. I work for Kaiser Soldier. That's what he's waiting no on me! I work for Kaiser Soldier. That's what he's waiting no on me!